Peter, put up your sword. I am going to drink from the cup that the Father has given me. Because Peter, it is through the drinking of the cup of suffering that you may drink from the cup of salvation. Are you looking for meaning or a word from God that's relevant to your life? Are you searching for a better understanding of who God is? Well, you're in the right place. You found the Gary Talks About God podcast. This is a weekly podcast that comes to you from the pulpit of Red Bank Missionary Baptist Church in Germantown, North Carolina. The podcast is hosted by Red Bank Senior Pastor Gary Sanders. Now let's get ready to take that walk through God's Word with our pastor, teacher, and friend. Hey, he's that guy we call Gary. We're going to begin our Easter series this morning titled His Final Steps. And over the next six weeks, his final steps will take us from the arrest in the garden all the way to the trial in the courtyard, the dilemma in the palace, the crucifixion on the hill, and the resurrection at the tomb. And as we journey to each one of those places, we will do it through the Gospel of John, which is where we'll be this morning in John chapter 18. And as you turn to John chapter 18, let me just give you some background information to, to bring us up to speed on what is happening because in the maybe the greatest theological truth you'll learn this morning, John chapter 18 precedes 17 other chapters. So some other stuff has happened to get us to John chapter 18. And one of the unique things about John is when you're reading and you read actually John 13 through 17, Everything that happens in John 13 through 17 is only recorded in the book of John. It's not recorded in the other Gospels. And so it gives us a unique insight into the final teachings of Christ that, that the, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not give us. Also, as you read John chapter 13 through 20, you're reading a, a, a span of maybe four days. It's a lot of material that is covered, but it only happens in in four days. And and of those four days, three of the days at the end in John chapter 20, it it takes on one day. So John 13 through John 18 really maybe only covers about eight hours. And and I bring that up because we read it and there's a lot of information. We think, man, this must be uh, taking a long time, but it's, it's really... Uh, fast-paced. Unfortunately, unlike Mark, who always uses the words immediately and hurries, that kind of propels us on that we're moving at a, at a good clip. John doesn't do that. But the material that we're looking at is, is just go cover, or, you know, eight hours at the most, maybe. So everything's going to happen in rapid fire. And when you go back to John chapter 13 and get to John 14, you have the Last Supper, So they're up in the upper room, they're having the Last Supper, and the end of John chapter 14, Jesus looks at the disciples and says, Arise, let us go from this place. And they leave the room with the Last Supper, and and, and they journey down through the upper city of Jerusalem, down to the lower city, and then out one of the gates, and, and, and they're walking, and as they're walking out to what we'll see in John 18, the garden, you know, they start walking, and they probably pass through a, a vineyard, which is why you get in those uh, John 14, 15, 16, the teaching where he says, you know, I am, I am the vine, you are the branches, remain in me, because they've got that visual imagery of, of the vineyard there, and he's using that, and, and I, I think that he's probably walking with them, and then they stop for a few minutes, and he talks with them and teaches them, and, he, and they keep walking and keep talking and keep walking and keep talking. And it's in those chapters we get the teaching of the Holy Spirit. We get the teaching of, I give you my joy so that my joy may, you know, may be full. You know, we're, we're encouraged to remain in Him. He tells about the persecution that's coming. He, he's telling us to, to keep His commandments. And you get to John chapter 17. And John chapter 17 is, is that high priestly prayer of Jesus where He prays for His disciples that are with Him at the moment. But at the same time, He prayed for you and me in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, Jesus prays for His disciples that would come. That, that would be me and you. Jesus prayed for us in John chapter 17. But there's one last piece of information we need to know before we read John 18 is this. That in John chapter 14 on that teaching, that prayer, Judas is not with the disciples. 
Judas is not with Jesus. And that's going to be important in just a minute. So let's pick up the reading in John chapter 18 down to verse 12 to see what happens. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having his sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain, the officers of the Jews, arrested Jesus and bound him. This morning, as we look at the arrest of the willing, I want to do so and just center it around two sentences, just two topics, two ideas. And the first one is this, the malfeasance of Judas, the malfeasance of Judas. And malfeasance means to do something just abhorrent. You can't believe that somebody would do that. Gross negligence. And what we see with Judas is that is exactly what is getting ready to happen. He's getting ready to do something that that we can't possibly understand why he would do it. Because he's about to betray Christ. And as we come to this section, we look at verse 1, it, it, our attention is immediately drawn back when he has spoken these words. It's immediately pushed back to all the teachings as, the, as they were walking and, and making their way to the garden. Everything that Jesus had just taught, he had taught to his 11 disciples because Judas was not there, he had already left. But it's to remind us that he has been teaching and instructing them what is happening. And they're on their way, they're, they're walking they're down to the garden, and from Matthew and Mark, we know that the garden is called Gethsemane. Now, this, this is not our garden, all right? This isn't tomato vines, and cucumber vines, and corn, this isn't squash, and okra, and all, all that good stuff. All right, this, this would be an, an olive grove. This is going to be a grove of olive trees, and, and, and probably has a, a small wall that, that surrounds it. And so into this garden... That's where they are going. And while that's interesting, it's not the most interesting part of the fact that John mentions that they are going to a garden. The part that is interesting is in verse 2, where he said, which he, or excuse me, that he and his disciples entered. That this was a garden where Jesus at the end often met there with his disciples, including Judas. For it tells us in verse 2, that Judas also knew the place. So this garden, this place where they went, this place was very familiar to them. This was a place where they would have gone to escape the crowds. This is where they would have been. It just would have been the 12 of them and Jesus, and, and they would have gotten some insider teaching that nobody else was privy to. This is where they would have gone just, just to relax. And the beauty of the garden. This is the place that maybe during the Passover, and even before that, that when they were tired and it was time to retire for the night, that Jesus would have went and camped there in the garden. You, do you realize that when we read the, the, the Gospels, we never see Christ going into a building save the upper room for the Last Supper? So maybe this is where they camped. 
And can you imagine that? I mean, those of you who have camped and those of you who have maybe a fire pit in your backyard, you're there at night and, or you're camping, you're out in your backyard at night and, and you light a fire and you're sitting around the fire with your friends and family and, and the setting just becomes so intimate. It, it's just a different setting. It's a, it's a different feel. To be around the campfire, to, to be outside in the night air and the, and the stars and, and, and cell phones are turned off and distractions are, are at a minimum. And it's usually in times like that that you start to talk and the conversation becomes deeper and more meaningful. You might tell stories or share insights that you, that you wouldn't share at maybe another time. Same would have happened with Jesus and his disciples. This would have been a place where they, they look back fondly because in that moment when they were in the garden, it, 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 it was free of the noise of ministry. And Judas would have been there as well. And he would have sat with them. And so Judas has this insider knowledge that he goes and he shares with the outsiders and that violation of trust. And it seems so, so much more abhorrent because th- this isn't just a street corner that they're walking by. This is a place where they have spent time together and the intimacy of the evening and a campfire perhaps and, and, and discuss the ministry and what is going on and what's happening and what's coming. And, and Judas just, he takes that insider information and uses it to betray Christ. But he doesn't do it alone. It says that he comes having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. So here he comes with two very different groups, <laughs> with two very different interests. Right? Romans and Jews working together to get rid of a troublemaker. They are a, a vivid illustration of the enemy of my enemy is my ally. <laughs> So they have banded together to come. And it's not a small crowd. For the word that is used there, uh, it says band. The word that is used there probably points to at least 200 soldiers. So you have maybe 200 soldiers. And and they would have been in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover to make sure that there, there wasn't any trouble, that the Jews didn't rise up again as they were accustomed to doing. So they would have been there, you know, to make sure everything stays calm and, 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 and quiet during the Passover. And with the Roman authorities comes some, some from the chief priest. Notice just the plural on that. There, there's only supposed to be one high priest at the time. <laughs> But there's two, Caiaphas and his father-in-law Annas, who was removed from his position by the Romans, but he retains his influence. So there's these two high priests, and, 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 and they have gone, and, and they've sent the temple guards who have already failed one time to, to capture Jesus. So they were sent again, and of course they're going to bring the soldiers because now they'll have this, this larger contingency. And so here comes this, this mob of soldiers and guards and Jewish leaders into the garden to arrest Jesus. And we're told that they come carrying torches and, and weapons. They came prepared just in case that this Jesus of Nazareth decides to, to cause some trouble and his Galilean fishermen decide to, to attack. And at that time, some zealots from the city decide to attack. Just in case that this one person that they want to arrest starts a riot, they are going to be prepared. And you can imagine the scene, right? Again, I've not served, but I know that many of you have. But, you know, before you go on the duty, before you go into a combat zone, what do you do? You stand out there and you check everything to make sure it's, it's correct. You can see the soldiers there maybe checking to make sure that their swords could come out of the sheath quickly if they need to. Making sure the grip on their spears is just the way they like it. The torches are, are burning bright enough for, for everybody to see, which is kind of funny because it was the Passover. It would have been a full moon. I'm told in verse 18 it was cold, so it would have been cloudless. They would have been able to see Christ. They didn't need the torches. But they're prepared just in case. And they enter into the garden to go to take the one that they had come for. And the scene is set. The act of betrayal is at hand. But as we read this, I think what we need to understand is that perhaps the most important statement about what is about to transpire 
as Judas betrays Christ, is not actually found in John chapter 18. It's found in John chapter 13, verse 30. And, and though it's five chapters back, it, it, it only occurred just a, maybe an hour beforehand. But it has direct bearing on what happens here. The scene is the Last Supper, and, and Jesus announces that someone will betray him, and all the disciples are looking around, is it me, is it me, who's going to betray me, who's going to betray me? And it says that after this, that Judas immediately went out. He, he left the upper room. That's why he's not with the disciples. That's, not, that's why he's not in the garden. That He left and went out of the room. But then it says this, these four words, and it was night. Now, at first thought, you might think, well, Gary, they got torches. I know it's not day. It is night. But it was more than just a descriptor of the day. It was more than just to let us know that it wasn't 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Because throughout the Gospel of John, night is used to describe the condition of people and their souls. Saying that their souls were dark. It was dark in the heart and the soul of Judas. And here in the darkness of that night comes Judas and the crowd and the darkness of their souls to arrest Christ. And with that, there is such great irony. Perhaps you would understand the irony better this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came to bear witness about the light, that all men might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And so here you have, and I quote, The light of the world was being seized by those in darkness carrying puny little torches. See the irony? They come in the darkness of the night to arrest the one who is the light of the world. And we understand in that that so many are drawn to the light, yet so many are unable to leave the darkness. And we see Judas coming in darkness because he could not leave it and leads those others who are enjoying the darkness to arrest the one who has come to bring light to the world. Now compare what Judas did with the majesty of Jesus. As we turn to Christ, what we notice first is the sovereignty of his plan. Verse 4 makes it very clear where Jesus says, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him. This does not catch him off guard. Jesus doesn't get up, look around, and go, oh my goodness, I didn't see this coming. What am I going to do? That, that, that's usually our reaction when, when something happens that we don't understand. Something happens that, that we weren't expecting. We, we throw our hands up and we're like, oh, I didn't see that coming. If, if only I had known, then I would have. That's why it's called a surprise, right? But this, and we then turn and we ascribe that same feeling to God. Well, it, it must have caught, caught God off guard as well. He must have been surprised by it. He must have been asleep. He must have been paying attention to somebody else or, or something because I'm surprised, so God must be surprised at all. No, he's not. Does not catch him off guard. This does not catch Christ off guard. He knew what was going to happen. Now, that thought, if you ask me, is both comforting and harrowing at the same time. It brings great comfort in times of pain to know that whatever I'm going through, Christ, he's not caught off guard by it. God knows the trial that I'm going through. He's not caught off guard by it. It becomes harrowing, on the other hand, in those times of failure when I go, man, Christ is not caught off guard by this either. (laughs) He knew I was going to fail. He knew I was going to stumble. And here Judas in his ultimate act of failure is not catching Jesus unaware. This is part of the whole plan. He knows that his hour is at hand. This is what he came for. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. 
In John 10, 18, he states, No one takes it, talking about his life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the plan from the very beginning. Everything that has transpired up until this point and will transpire over the next couple of days has done so under God's sovereign hand. And you look at all the people with the weapons and, and, and the torches, and they think, man, we, we are going to catch him off guard in the garden. He's never going to see us coming, never in the mind. It's 200 people with torches. I think he could have saw him coming up the path, don't you? It's not catching him off guard. And so they enter that, that garden, and they probably think that Jesus is going to cower. He's going to, again, run, maybe hide in the shadows. That's really the only reason to, to need the torches to search out the shadows. The, the moon would have given light. And Jesus, as soon as they come in there, Jesus comes from the back, and he immediately takes control of the crowd, of the entire situation. And he comes and he looks at him and says, Whom do you seek? Who are you searching for? This is kind of like Jesus stepping forward and going, are, are, you, are you looking for me? Have you come for, for me? Now this is amazing. Because there's been another time where, where people came to look for Christ. And instead of stepping forward saying, who are you looking for? He disappeared. Right? He was feeding the 5,000. And after feeding of the 5,000, it says in John chapter 6 that they came and they wanted to make him king. They were going to compel him to be king. They were waiting for the Messiah to to, to throw off the Romans, to to reestablish Israel. So here was the Messiah. If he was the Messiah, he's going to be king. Let's go ahead and crown him king. And instead of stepping forward and saying, here I am, it says that he withdrew to the mountain. So they could not find him. It was not time for him to be crowned king. But here in the garden, with the shadow of the cross looming over it, the time was right. So when he was determined by the crowd to be crowned king, he leaves. But when the crowd comes to take him to the cross, he steps forward. He says, who are you looking for? Are you looking for me? And when he does that, we notice the power of his words. Because they look at him and they respond. They say, we, we've come for Jesus of Nazareth, which is an interesting way to, to call Jesus. He's not na- known by what occupation he was, he, he, a carpenter. He wasn't named, known by his, his father. He was known as Jesus of Nazareth, which may have been a, a, a derogatory remark. Remember Nathaniel? What good can come from Nazareth? We're looking for this man, Jesus, who comes from the little lowly nowhere backwood city called Nazareth. And as they ask that, when he asks, whom do you seek? We're told that Judas was there as well, standing with them. You know, it's always easy to stand for lies and darkness when you stand with the crowd. And Judas is standing with the crowd, and Jesus looks at Judas and the crowds, and he responds with two words. It's three usually in translations, and I wish they wouldn't put the he in there, because when they put the he at the end, it just it, it, it loses all its power. They say, Jesus says, whom are you looking for? Who do you see? Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus walks up to him and says, I am. Y'all can just X out the he. The he is, an orig- is, is not in the original. It's a clarifier for us in the English. I am. For us, you know, we use that word, you know, who, I, you know I am here, you know, here I am. We just use it as, as a state of being verb because that's what it is in the English language. But that's not what it was for the Jews. It, it meant so much more. You go all the way back to Exodus chapter 2 and chapter 3. Moses is standing at the burning bush. God speaks to him out of the burning bush. Go to Egypt, deliver my people. Moses asked a very logical question at that moment. Well, second to, why is the bush talking? He doesn't ask that question, I would have. 
but he looks and he says, all right, when I go back, when I go into the land and I go to the Jews and I go to my people and, and I say, you know, God has spoken to me, you know, come on, let's go. And they look at me and they say, what is his name? What do I tell them? And he, God, said, to, said this, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me. Moses, who sent you? I am. Who? I am. Moses, who, who told you to come and deliver us? I am sent me. Moses, what was his name? I am. So make no mistake, when they come for Jesus and he looks at them and he says, I am. This is an absolute authoritative declaration of divinity. This is, is, is Jesus saying, I am God. Throughout the book of John, there's the seven great I am statements, right? I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection of the life. I am, I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. And in John chapter 8 is one of them where he says, I am the light of the world, which, which has this extended conversation with the Pharisees and the scribes afterwards and onlookers and everybody. And he gets to the end of the conversation and he says, you know, if Abraham, he, he was looking forward to my day. And they kind of scratch their head and go, how have you seen Abraham? You're not even 50. And he looks at, at the mass that's gathered before him and says, truly, truly, before Abraham was, I am. And it says what? The next little thing is just one of those, it, it's like, why did John include that? It says they picked up stones to stone him. Because the punishment for blasphemy was to be stoned. When he says that in John chapter 8, they know that he is saying that he is is God. When he says it here in John chapter 18, he is saying, he is God. And this statement is so majestic that they can't even stand in his presence. As soon as he says, I am, it says that they they drew back and fell to the ground. They couldn't stand in his presence after he uttered those words. And then, in, in my warped sense of, of thinking, I, I find the funniest scene to occur next. Verse 7, so he asked them again, Whom do you seek? I'm not sure I would have wanted to answer that the second time. Because the first time when I said, Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I am, and I fell to the ground. I might not want to go through that another time. And while I find it humorous, I also find it intriguing. Because they have a second chance. They have a second chance after this declaration to look at Christ and go, He is. He is. He is God. He is everything that He has claimed to be. He is, he, he is God in the flesh. And, and they have the opportunity to respond to his divinity and to bow to him in, in a, a spirit of humility and, and reverence and submission. But they don't. They don't. They enjoy the darkness and they stand fixed in it. So even at the power of his words that drove them to their knees and caused them to fall down, they could not on their own accord bow their knee to him. And then the story continues. We see also the security of his hands. Because after he asked them the second time, he said, I told you I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Verse 9, this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me. I have lost not one. As he steps forward to to make himself known, he's also stepping forward to protect his disciples. The attention would now be on him instead of of them. Here here I am. You're you're looking for me. I'm right here. Let let these people who are with me, let, let them go. And interestingly, John says, that this was to fulfill the words that he had spoken. You would think then that John would go back to some Old Testament prophecy or 
or something, but interestingly enough, he's, he's going back and quoting what he just wrote in John chapter 17. <laughs> in verse 11, as, as Jesus is praying, he says, you know, I, I, I've not lost any. I've kept them in your name. Verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, save the son of destruction, that Scripture might be fulfilled. So John, in, in, in that verse, and pointing back to John 17, is testifying to the fact that Jesus, the words of Jesus carried the weight of divine revelation. That when he speaks, he speaks at, at truth, that his words are, are, are truth, because he, in fact, is God. But we see in the security of his hands that, that he's not going to lose any. It's the symbol of power, the, the one who, who saves. His disciples were in his hands, and he's held them, and, and nobody, no thing, no anything can pry open his hands and pluck his children from them. Any the power, no principalities, no things to come. No, no, no anyone, even us, we can't be on the inside. I, I know, forgive me, you know how my mind thinks, pushing up on his finger going, I want out, I want out, I want out. Because if we are His, we are His for all eternity. And, and, and we cannot be removed from the security of His hands. That, that's where we remain. And He says, I've not lost any. He didn't lose any of them. And He's not going to lose you either. Jesus isn't going to forget you, lose you, or allow you to fall from His hands. Because his hands are secure. But it ends with the willingness of his soul. Because as this is playing out, Peter, God, God bless Peter, right? He, he, he can't stand it anymore. He, he's watching this happening and, and he can't, it, it's, it's enough. They've, they've come to get Jesus. Jesus has said, Jesus, you will not go to the cross as long as I am with you. I will protect you. I will guard you. I'm your man. This isn't going to happen. So Peter does what? He grabs his sword and, and, and he runs and he, he, he whacks off the, the, the servant's ear. And I, I don't know. I don't know if Peter was just such an excellent wielder of a sword that he could clip an ear and miss the head or if he was such a lousy sword wielder that he missed the head and got the ear. I don't, I don't know which one it is. You know? But, but he's doing that. And, 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 and if Jesus was going to lead a rebellion, that right there would have been the time at the swing of Peter's sword. Jesus would have went forward, the disciples would have went forward, the, the, all the others would have went forward, zealots maybe from the city would have come out. If that was the time for, for Jesus to lead the revolt, that, that would have been the opportune time. But instead, what we find out from Luke is that Jesus actually, Luke the physician tells us this, that Jesus used his hands instead of leading the revolt, picked up his ear and restored the ear of Malchus. And after he does that, he turns around and he looks at Peter and he says to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Again, Peter, now is not the time. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? I mean, he, he rebukes Peter. Peter, th th this is, your bravado is not just foolish. It's standing in the way of the plan. What you're trying to do, Peter, is, is a very denial of the work that I have come to accomplish. Put your sword up, Peter. There's a good warning for us in that as well. How many times we think we're standing for the Lord when in fact we find out that we're standing in the way of the Lord? Peter thinks that what he, what's about to happen, that, that he can prevent it. It all depends on him. John and James, the son of thunder, are, are, are strangely quiet. Simon the Sellet isn't, you know, rousing up, trying to get people to, to sneak around and, and flank the soldiers. Philip and Nathaniel, I, I don't know what they're doing. Where's the twin? It all depends on me. So Peter grabs his sword and he rushes in. One against 200. 
trained soldiers. Good luck with that uh, fisherman who happens to have a sword. But at the same time, Judas thinks that everything depends on him too, doesn't it? For the plan, for the betrayal to work, for Jesus to go to the cross, for me to get my 30 pieces of silver, it all depends on me bringing the soldiers into the garden to arrest Jesus. The authorities think the same thing, right? It all depends on them. They're there with their torches and their weapons. It all depends on them to get him and take him to Pilate and, and go through the trial and to lead him to the hill to crucify him. It, it, it all depends on them. And every one of them is wrong. Because what is about to happen all depends on the willingness of Jesus to drink from the cup. For if he was not willing to drink from the cup, can I not call down a legion of angels, Peter? Can I not call down those to come and, and, and stand and fight for me? So I don't need your sword, Peter. Put your sword up because I'm going to drink from the cup that the Father has given me. The cup was a symbol of in the Old Testament of of suffering and and the pouring out of God's wrath. And and Peter would have understood that. That the cup is, is, is the suffering that Jesus is about to endure on the cross. The the suffering under the the wrath of God for our sins. Peter, put up your sword. Shall I not do what God the Father has sent me to do? Because Peter is through the drinking of the cup of suffering that you may drink from the cup of salvation. Peter, put up your sword. And you hear then in that statement the willingness of Christ. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me. It happens because He is willing. And then we just have this one statement in verse 12. So the band of soldiers and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound Him. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They didn't arrest the king. The king gave himself over. And he gave himself over so that the sovereign plan of the Father could be completed by the willingness of the Son. So that from what he endures on the cross and the suffering that it brings will ultimately bring us salvation. You've been listening to the Gary Talks About God podcast. Are you looking for a church? Well, Red Bank Missionary Baptist Church is a community of believers who exist to glorify God and see transform lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can find us on the web at www.redbankmbc.com. Also, come visit us on Sunday at 8104 Red Bank Road in Germantown, North Carolina. Did you like this podcast? We put one out each and every week, so don't forget to subscribe. We hope this has been a blessing to you, and we thank you for listening.